before and I said I haven't read anything about him and then I, I, I watched his inaugural speech so I could speak a bit about him and then the other thing was the G20 I didn't actually research that much about G20 this week so I took it with me to read but I didn't have time so there we are so it's open forum for people to begin the subject matter yeah, and then I'll, I'll wonder. Can I ask you a question? I am a bit uh, disturbed by this trend towards uh, international divisions of nations. While as a Marxist, <coughs> I mostly believe in the internationalism of the working class, of the exploited, I mean, labor versus capital, it makes sense. If you indulge in the internationalism of nations, we somehow tend to believe that one nation, because of certain policies, will adjust the contradictions. And I believe that the contradictions should be uh, mostly in the hands of the educated middle class, which provide the theory that can be used for the emancipation of the working class. I'm not sure about the last bit, but in any case, I'll try yeah. and answer you and, and, and yeah. address the fundamental question that is being asked by Elisa here. And this is Speaker's Corner. Some of you are new, some of you are, have been here forever. Uh, myself, I've been here 32 years. So I'm part of the furniture. I don't know how long you've been here. And, and yourself, Elisa? Oh, I, I came here the first time uh, as a little girl in 68. Well, there you go. So we go back quite a long time here. Um, and Elisa has asked the question basically, as I understand it, why is the world turning towards nationalism when she supports, and certainly from that sort of time, the belief in internationalism, the belief in the breakdown of boundaries and borders between people, yes. and the increasing integration of the world and the people of the world into some sort of harmonious uh, 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 unity. And I do agree that fundamentally, uh, the argument for internationalism is a very powerful argument. But I don't put that argument, I don't wish to understand that argument merely as a uh, a dream, a utopian concept of integrating and unifying. I think you also have to understand the concrete circumstances in which any form of unification and dissolution of national boundaries occurs. And one of the key components, not the decisive one, but one of the key components behind the vote for Brexit in Britain was the belief and it wasn't only a right-wing belief, that by the way, but was the belief that the integration under the control of the existing European Union constituted an attack on certain democratic rights within the individual country, Britain, in this particular case. That was one of the arguments. Tony Benn, for example, used to argue that. Yes. He was one of the most famous left-wing yes. politicians in yes. British modern 20th century, in fact, all British history. However, despite the lack of democratic control over the European Union, myself, I voted to remain in the European Union. That does not, however, imply that I support the present campaign orchestrated by some people uh, from the right wing of the Labour Party and the Liberal Party. Uh, that is the, the campaign, they, they say, to, to remain inside the European, call a new vote and remain inside the European. I don't support that campaign. Let me clarify what I mean by the view about the, the European Union. Basically, we have to understand what the institutional framework is. What is the country? What is the European Union? What is the Globe World Trade Organization? What do they actually represent? And I think it's important to understand this distinction between arguing for membership of the European Union as a, a conceptual idea, as being a member of something that is larger than a nation, that unifies people, that allows free movement, and the understanding about what the actual reality on the ground is. How people actually unify. 
how there's a real correspondence of interest established between people. And for that argument, you have to go back to the 18th or 19th century to understand what the idea of the first international was, the people who wanted to form a single unified world. But they wanted to do so on the basis of a particular social grouping. Because the world, Brexit or no Brexit, the world, as far as the upper stratum of society is concerned, there are no boundaries and borders. I mean, look, the Saudi Arabian king, what's his name? What's his name in our company? You've also, sorry? Salman. The Saudi Arabian king, he traveled this week to Argentina. There he shook hands with Theresa May. Everything points towards the evidence that he authorized the killing, the chopping up and the dropping of a body of a journalist in the embassy of the Saudi, Saudi embassy in Turkey, drop his body in acid to get rid of it. This guy is welcome in Buenos Aires and he shakes the hand of all the leaders of the world's G20 nations. Now, therefore we know that crime, no crime, murder, slaughter, theft, robbery, dictatorial power over his own people does not prevent him from freely moving from one country to another. If you go into the Dorchester Hotel, 500 meters from where we are, you will find amongst the assorted literati and wealthy people, probably 10 or 20% are international criminals and gangsters. And yet when they arrive in London, they're picked up by chauffeur-driven cars, limousines, blacked out windows and welcomed in high society. The multi-millionaires and billionaires are a, they're not worried about Brexit from the point of view of freedom of movement because they know that if they arrive in England and they got two million pounds to invest, they are granted permission to remain in Britain as investors involved in the economy. And if they have got less money than that, I'll take you one second, they can go to Malta or Portugal or Germany and invest anywhere between, I think it's £50,000 in Portugal, a couple of hundred thousand pounds in Malta. And there you are, you have the passport. And so the idea that Brexit and restriction of freedom of movement is something that will be universally applied to all social classes is not true. There will be restrictions on the movement of certain groups of people. Now, my brother supports leaving the European Union. I supported remaining in the European Union. We had an argument. My mother, who's German, came here in 1953. My father's Chinese came here in 1953. I'm born here, my brother says he wants to leave the European Union. He takes a sort of, you know, re-smog position. Whoa. My mother takes a position of belief because she grew up as a child with bombs dropping around her and uh, the Nazis in power in Germany. And when she got the chance, she left Germany. And she doesn't feel comfortable in Germany, that's the truth of the matter. And she believes in... Uh, and internationalism and expanding internationalism around the world as a generic belief. We should unite the people, bring down the borders. You know, John Lennon, imagine. Thank you for screaming about that. <laughs> my fans, my fans, stay calm. Uh, you were gonna say, sorry. I was gonna say, do not the... Uh... No, it's okay. <laughs> do, not the, do not like big, big businessmen and big business women in England do they not want cheap labour from Eastern Europe to come into Britain? Do they not I want mean, free movement? Of I was going to point this out, which is which was why I brought up my mother in the first place. She made a very good point. And I think it's true. In many parts of Britain where people voted for Brexit, 
they didn't dare to say the reason they actually voted Brexit. Because the world is a world. Many people, you'll meet them now, the Tommy Robinson crew hang around here. They say to you a bit more openly what the issue is for them. Many of them have a, because politics is not about rationality and logic. There was a guy last week, remember? He constantly bleating on at me. You're not arguing logic, rationality. You're speaking in a way that tries to move people. You know, as if you can speak in a way that doesn't do that. But yes, I do that. I admit I do that. Why? Because it's oratory. That's what oratory is. That's why I speak at Speaker's Corner. The joy and the response from oratory. Yeah, yeah. Oratory is about the, you know, can you stand up, hold an audience, speak to them, change their minds, engage with them, discuss with them, learn from them. You know, that's what I'm about here at Speaker's Corner. So she said the following, it's an interesting point. Many people in Britain, since the economic crisis of 2008, began to feel there's too many bloody foreigners in Britain. That's the bottom line. And when they felt that, they can't actually see from a distance, looking around the audience here, you can't see who's Polish. You can't see <laughs> who's Romanian. Now you're the Pole, there you go, you can see him over there. But can you tell him now from the others? You can't. And therefore, underlying the vote when they said, we want to slow down immigration, what they really meant was, we want less black and brown faces. That's the reality. Less black and brown faces. That's really what it meant. I can't see where you are. Come forward. You wanted to say something, but who was it? Or is it just the no? What didn't mean? No, I didn't say it was just about that. I said, my mother made this point, and I think there's truth in it. And that is that those who wanted to limit immigration were more concerned about Islam, about blacks and Indians, than they are about Poles and Romanians. But I'm saying what my mother said. I'm not saying it's not an assumption. I didn't say there were there was the only viewpoint. I said my mother made a point that I think is relevant. It's, you can't lump everybody in the same category, but I think it's an important point to understand. Go on, you, go on. What are you going to say? I didn't say that. I explicitly stated that's not. But anyway, carry on. I think that's very rare. There are, I have heard a couple of people say that. A couple of people say that. Well, I'm saying a couple, whereas I actually mean one in this case. But never mind, by using the word couple, it's a generic term, as you well know, and therefore I wasn't being, spe by saying couple, I was specifically not being specific. I'm not trivialising at all. I can't quite. I said, oh, you're not listening to what I say. I said, I heard it from one or two. I said, I have heard one or two people say that. I didn't say there are only one or two people who say that. Rarity, yes. I have, yes. I have spoken to people from many different kinds. I've spoken, you see, I have an advantage. I agree with you. I, well, the, if it's an economic question, that's one element to it. Some people in some parts of the country wanted to say the economic problem, which is caused not by foreigners, but is caused by the global economic crisis that happened in 2008. Because before that is perfectly true, there was a welcoming attitude in general because the economy was supposedly booming credit was easily available. You only had to buy a house on cheap credit to be able to increase the amount of money you believed you had. And so we lived in a cuckoo land whereby people believed 
pushed up by cheap credit through the global banking system, that the world economy under capitalism would expand and integrate increasingly the world's population. So the expansion of the European Union, the breakdown of borders, the creation of a single currency would be the precursor to a global process of integration. That imagination collapsed in 2008 after the profit rate had declined, companies refused to invest, seized up and withdrew their resources, pumped their money into financial speculation, into bubbles that eventually collapsed in 2008. And then, yes, when people feel a tighter pocket, less money, then yes, the person who moves in next door becomes a bigger issue. The person who gets a job, the person in the NHS, the person in the unemployment office becomes an issue. Well, he said, he said it's economic. I'm pointing, out, I'm pointing out not only the immigration issue, of course it's my opinion. I speak my opinion. If you want me to speak your opinion, I won't do it. Now, of course I'm making assumptions. Everybody makes assumptions. Mine, however, are reasonably well grounded and informed. What the friggin' hell do you think I do here? I mean, I mean, to be fair, okay, I spent 10 years or 8 years preparing my PhD and I spent a lot of time, a lot of time doing research. However, for 32 years, I've been speaking here at Speaker's Corner. 32 years. There isn't another speaker here spoken longer at Speaker's Corner. And to be fair, if you look around the audience, if you look around the audience here at Speaker's Corner, we have, we have the most unique mixture of people. We have the rich and the poor. Hang on. We have homeless people come to Speaker's Corner. We have every nationality come here. We have the rich and the poor. You know, so the idea that I don't get around and meet people, I don't just speak here, I get down and talk to people as well afterwards. About a third of the people here know me personally. I have a fair amount of contact with the world. It may not be the perfect snapshot of the world, but it's a fair amount of contact. And so I think your argument why don't you stick to, instead of saying, I am doing this, I am doing that, why don't you discuss the actual arguments that I'm making? So do that. Well, that's not a discussion. That's a slander against me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I pointed out earlier. Well, I'm going to try and point that out again because you didn't listen to what it was. I said, if you are a multimillionaire, you have no problem moving around the world, Brexit or no Brexit. Right? So clearly, there is a distinction between the impact of immigration, the impact of economics on your ability to move. Look at the people in South America now moving, what is it, Honduras, to get to America. Marching thousands of miles. This is not a British process. Look at the people moving from Syria. Walking, walking right across Turkey. Walking across Greece, going on boats, and people coming now from Iran, on boats from France, and dying in the sea as a consequence of attempting to find a better life, an economic impulse, and a military impulse in some cases for them to leave and the inability of global capitalism to raise the living standards of the people which means that people must move from where they live in order to survive that is the reason why why do you think sorry what well i'm sorry whether capitalism has given Hang on. Where the cap? <coughs> Hang on. Okay. Hang on. One, one at a time. One at a time. The gentleman said something. I'm respond to him. Then I'll come back to you.
talk about that. What was that again? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Firstly, the argument that you made, capitalism's brought out prosperity. It's not true in the first place. However, there's a double-edged... I'll better say it. I'll clarify what I mean. The Renaissance and capitalism are slightly different things, but in any case... Capitalism, in essence, is a system of commodity production for profit. It produces commodities to satisfy the wants of the mind and the body to make profits from them. If you can't make profit out of it, you close down the enterprise. That's the basic law of capitalism. That doesn't mean there aren't some companies, for example, the British farming industry, the German farming industry, the French farming industry, that does not really operate, although they, they say they are capitalist farms, but in reality, they live from European subsidies. There are also companies in Britain or America, like the military companies in Britain and America, that also live from government handouts. There are many British pharmaceutical companies that live from subsidies paid them by the National Health Service. There are many banks in Britain. NatWest, Barclays Bank, Lloyds Bank, uh, what was the other one, the big four, HSBC. They live, they survive because government bails them out. That's why. No, we bail them out. Yes, government bails them out and then chucks the bill on the next generation. Let him speak. Capitalism doesn't like, bailing out banks isn't capitalism. That's not capitalism. Like, well, shouldn't be considered capitalism. Capitalism is private profit, individual losses. Well, I, I accept this. But you see, every system, when you say what you say, when I described capitalism as commodity production for profit, really I'm stripping it down to the naked self. You're trying to do the same thing. I understand the logic behind that. However, the truth of the matter is, when we do so, we're engaging in a scientific methodology of abstraction. In other words, we look at an animal that's got four legs and has got fur on it, and it's got pointed ears and eyes and runs around and barks, and we call it a dog. We look at another animal with fur on it, with pointed ears, it runs around, jumps up and down, it's got a tail, also lives it, and we say it's a cat. Regardless if, it's a P, if, it, if the dog is a Pekingese or a Great Dane, or if the cat is a little uh, Siamese cat or a lion. They are cats, right? Now, yes, there are nuances. You can turn around and say, my God, that cat's big. It can't be a cat. My God, that cat doesn't behave the same way as my Siamese does. It bites my arm off. The Siamese doesn't. And therefore, you can confuse the idea from taking pure abstraction and extrapolating from that to the generality by saying, oh, if we save the banks by government money, that's not capitalism. In fact, throughout the existence of capitalism, commodity production of profit, Government has always been involved in protecting and defending the system of capitalism. When the slave trade was organised by capitalist traders in Britain, trading sugar, guns and slaves across the triangle from Africa, London, Liverpool, London, Bristol, London and North America and Ghana, and Ivory Coast, the British government was involved. The bankers were involved. The financiers were involved. The capitalists were involved. The arms producers were involved. Capitalism always has received government support. In fact, the definition of the modern world is capitalism as a core abstract economic system by which I mean 
that the dominant levers of the economy, the 150 dominant companies in Britain, there are 6 million companies in Britain, but 150 of them control 70 to 80 percent of the value of the economy in Britain. Sorry? Also with government subsidy. Because capitalism as a pure system, you'll know this yourself, anyone who bothers to check any type of economic activity or even just play the game Monopoly, you will know the automatic tendency within capitalism is towards Monopoly. And Monopoly manipulates and distorts market conditions. We have laws imposed by government. Why does government impose laws on monopolies? Why? Because not because government is opposed to monopoly, but because government wants to maintain the power and authority of capitalism as a totality. One is not one capitalist or the other capitalist or that capitalist or this capitalist. It's the total, total system of capitalism that is defended by the governments. And that's why I will say Marx was correct to define the government of Britain at that time and now as a capitalist government. A government whose overall purpose and objective, their interests, their associations, their affinity, their friendships, their lifeblood is an affinity with capitalism. That's just affinity with power. It's, the same it's not Russia. just with power. It's the same in Russia for 60, 70 years. Well, it's slightly different, uh, actually. The people in power there did everything in their control in the system they lived in to maintain their position of power and to maintain their concentration of wealth. And people in the West do the same thing. When you become powerful, it becomes easy to become more powerful. When you right. generate capital, it becomes easier right. but, to but generate see, more capital. But you see, someone asked... Now, the system's, the system's job is to redistribute that wealth appropriately. And I would agree that that well, doesn't that, that, happen uh, currently. Well, uh, we, 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 we have no, we have no empirical is. justification, no that. evidence to argue that the system's purpose is to redistribute. Well, it should be in order to make... Well, order to you believe that, that as a normative view. It's your personal view. It is not, however, evidentially based, because it is. That's what the NHS well, there was that's what tax does. That's the what NHS. The, you see, the NHS is, is not a capitalist institution. Yeah, it's a social the element, institution. the, but the it's NHS it's is a communist. The NHS is a communist institution capitalism. within capitalism. Yes, but it's still part of the system, which includes well, capitalism. Well, yes, economics yes, for, uh, but yeah. you see, the evidential basis is not the NHS. The NHS was a product of the struggle of the working people who have an affinity, whether you like it or not, historically, there is, an, there is a verifiable affinity between the interests of workers and workers' parties and the formation or an introduction of institutions and policies that defend or advance the conditions of the majority. National Health Service, welfare state, council housing, social welfare programs, minimum wages, trade union rights, all the things that Labour is supposed to stand for. And so that is not, in my view, simply to be understood as the system of capitalism protecting itself. On the contrary, that is the emergence of a system opposed to capitalism within the system of capitalism. It should work within wait, capitalism it's a, it's a, a yes. need to destroy Exactly. Capitalism. It's a symbiosis. Well, because, yeah. wait, it is a symbiosis because it wouldn't actually work. Go, go, it wouldn't exist. It wouldn't work without the capitalist system. You see, where we've got to with this argument so far, which I think is a positive thing, is that we're looking at two social systems in formation in the 20th century. One based upon the idea of commodity production for profit. The other based upon the idea of the belief in, from each according, Marx described in a manifesto, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. Sorry? I don't think, I don't think, I think capitalism is an economic system thing. No, I think uh, socialism is a political and social system. 
maybe you'd be, you'd be more accurate to describe liberalism as, as the as the opponent there. You know, no, no. No, I want to deal with what the gentleman here and we ma managed to find some framework for discussing the question by abstracting from the appearances of this or that distortion. We can get, we can understand the fundamentals. Once we understand the fundamentals, we can see how the impact of one system affects and changes the other system, well, I have and how the system from another system affects and changes fine. that system. Fine, Let me just fine, illustrate fine, what fine. I mean. Let's say that's true. Yeah. So, in Britain, which is one of the oldest capitalist countries in the world, we have elements of communism and socialism. I believe they are the elements that fundamentally describe why the workers in Britain don't live like the workers in, uh, I don't know, some of the much poor, poor countries of the world. Guatemala, Ethiopia, you know, Nigeria. the more poor countries of the world. The reason why the living standards rose was because organized labor came together to increase and improve the living standards and conditions of the masses. Take another example though. In the United States, there is a more pure form, a more pure form of capitalism, less state intervention, less welfare provision, more extreme poverty, more extremity of inequality, and a far greater concentration of wealth at the top than you have in Britain, given the fact that there's certain provision in Britain for poverty and starvation, that sort of thing. On the other side, you could take another example which I believe, which is my own speciality of research, which is China. In China, you have elements of socialism which dominate the economy. The Chinese economy is majority publicly owned. The dominant sectors of the economy are publicly owned. Correct. Telecommunication. Sorry? Well, as we're pointing out, there is a separation between these systemic characteristics which are fundamental and those which are not. So I am arguing, contrary to the viewpoint which you're implying, I do not believe that socialism inevitably means gulags, concentration camps or human rights abuses. On the co well, well, I can, it is perfectly true. Well, let, me, let me respond to you. You are arguing, therefore, that that idea of socialism inevitably ends in a gulag. That's what you're arguing. Well, well I, I can I, argue that it doesn't, but I would have to stand up there to share. Well, well, no, really. However, so if you invite however, me to stand up there, I will I, share I will try, what I, Marx failed welcome, to see. You're welcome, Marx, you're welcome to put your let point me just of view, say this, but I'll though. try and argue my we, point of view. Well, may I just share something about Marx? Because he, you, you see, the story you tell, we all know, right? But what we don't know well, is what Marx failed to share with us, Tell us, which is the reason why the system is like this today, right, is because of the way that the organization, people and people get together to create organizations where decision making is made at the top and the value distribution is extractive towards the top. That's the reason why we look like this, right? Yeah, what, now, what, what we no, need to do... But what you said was you tell us, like, Marx didn't say, Marx did say that. Well, actually, Marx didn't come up with a solution for the fact that the guys at the top extract a disproportionate amount of control and value at the top because of the way when they get together, the founders and the investors yield a certain level of control and they design their organizational structure to extract as much value as possible from the network, from the members of the organization who you call workers. Else. I, I don't really agree you with didn't you said, come up with a solution for said, that, but there is a solution and it's called, well, it's about taking an introspective view. When we come to form an organization, people get together around a good idea. We need to take an introspective view that allows the founders to create an organization with members in a way where the decision making and the value distribution is attractive to the members and to build an organization and then to bring in the investors. And then the members and the partners will be in a better negotiating position to dictate the decision making and the value distribution in an organization. That's where we need to take the thinking. Otherwise, you're missing the boat altogether. I want to come back to, I want to, come back to the argument you made a second ago and respond to that question. You see, if you say you're legitimate in arguing this, 
the examples of socialism have failed, You're, as far as human rights and economic development is concerned. The two combination. You could argue they're perfectly legitimate. However, I will argue, I will counter the argument this way. When Marx lived in London in the 18, from 1849 to 1883, we had no right to vote. Neither men nor women, apart from the upper class, had the right to vote. So you could have turned out as Marx did at the time and said, nowhere in the world has capitalism created democracy and capitalism. And he was right. At that time, they had not. No, we're not talking about that. You're talking about that. You're claiming it's liberalism. We have, we have decided, we have decided a few minutes ago, whether you agree with it or not, to base ourselves on fundamental abstractions about the nature of the system. Liberalism is a type of capitalism. It's a democratic, liberal type of capitalism, which we are grad which we are more than gradually moving away from at the moment. Right? The United States, Brazil, the tendencies in Germany, some of the tendencies we're seeing in Britain. Well, I don't agree that's fascism either. Fascism is what you saw in Germany, Italy, Spain, and that constitutes a different characteristic. That is where a section of the middle classes and the destroyed layers of the working class unify together and smash every independent organization of the workers. And by doing so, they bring the population under a totalitarian grip, but under a system of capitalism. Germany was capitalist right throughout Adolf Hitler's rule. Spain was capitalist, but it was capitalist. The system of economy was capitalist. And th that it is was the a point. privately that, owned economy, my friend, my friend. Produce, wait, wait, producing wait, wait. goods for profit. For profit. Why is that no, we're discussing, you see, you said to me, what we're discussing is liberalism. And I tried to point back to the way in which the discussion had gone, which was to abstract the fundamental naked creature so that we can see the different forms it can adopt. One form is liberalism, another form is fascism, My friend, let me another here. form is, is you know, what I'm social to democracy. Another form is another what I'm trying to describe, which yes, is the, you could have, the transcendental yes, that. movement that we're about to enter, which I believe you are not aware of. Well, the transcendental movement does the following to capitalism. Well, not capitalism too much, please. looks, well, not too much, but capitalism you've described can take a totalitarian air, and capitalism can also take a beautiful, socially conscious, spiritually well, I don't uh, believe that's possible. advanced air. Uh, I don't believe that's possible. If you're that doesn't on, mean. No, but I'll if you're, why. let me just I'll finish you this. Why Your argument is that back then there was never no. an example of capitalism looking liberal, <laughs> and look how now it is a bit more liberal than it was back then. What but I'm why trying to tell is you is, the with the same argument in why the future, you will see yes. this uh, spiritually conscious capitalism, which is blind right. to you today. And, he believes, and the answer. And he he believes, is in organizational right, structures, just, just, just decision making that. and value just, just distribution in organizations. We are witnessing, we are witnessing in the world today the biggest transformation of capitalism from liberal democratic capitalism, progressive rights, progressive ideas, increasing intercommunication, uh, linking together the nations and so on, the European Union, Hillary, Hillary Clinton, you know, this type of argument, globalization, we are witnessing the reversal of that. No, no, we're not. We're re witnessing a slight regression. One minute. One minute. Bro. One, it's one, a one minute. I'm trying to deal with your question. Yeah. Now, while that idea existed, there were people who believed that the purpose, this liberal objective, is to move in a certain direction. And the evidence shows that if you don't move in a certain direction, you're moving in another direction. That other direction could have been, in the 20th century, towards socialism. Yeah. Or it could be, in the, tw or the 20th century, towards fascism. 
or it could be in the 21st century, towards this reactionary nationalistic agenda that I don't believe is fascism, but is reactionary, is yeah. backward looking. Yeah, that's what we're seeing now. Yeah. Is inward looking and is the opposite of what you're trying absolutely, to describe. Absolutely, right? now, and he's right. Now, but that's on if the you're other looking side, at it and on the you're other side, it once something you on the begin extremities, to peel away, in, and woohoo, the revolution will happen so naturally let through me, capitalism. Let me, put it, let me put it in a much wider perspective and then narrow it down on your view. Because I have solutions and you what? only have problems. Am I not like stop, Am I stopping you? Critique, critique. Am I stopping you from speaking? I have something to share. Am I stopping you from participating? No, I love this. No. Please go so ahead. So just give a bit of leeway of course, as well. Of yeah? well come on. Now, I mean, you're up there, so the leeway is there. So. I am, but I mean, I could just rant, rave, and ignore you. No, I but appreciate not, you engaging. Right? Yeah, I would just like to say thank you very much for the piece of information you shared as to why the Second World War came to First an end. World War. First oh. World War. And you mentioned that it had to do with the... Revolution. Uh, revolution. That's I was it. never taught that in school. And I'm glad you taught me that, because all these years, Thank nobody you, ever Thank taught you, me that. Thank Thanks you, very much. Now, the argument I'm going to make is follow, to put it in a generic, global, historical perspective. Human beings and our ancestors have existed on Earth for two million years, according to the data we have today. They originated in Tanzania and Ethiopia and they were defined from all other species because of their ability to use tools. The hand axe being the key. What Neil McGregor, the former director of the British Museum said, the hand axe was the passport to the world. No borders, no nations. We moved because we had tools and tools enabled us to move. Correct. Now we have passports, borders, biometrics, laws, nations, currencies. But underneath the surface, the naked being emerged as a species because of our relationship to tools. Now, Marx is basing his entire argument on the fact that throughout two million years of all of our ancestors making tools, changing the world, making shelter, producing, extracting, making objects of beauty and art. And yet, most of the world owns, noth owns, owns nothing inherited from that past. Nothing. 60% of the British population have less than a thousand pounds in savings. 42% of the London population have less than a hundred pounds in savings. That's right. That's Two right. million years yes, of ancestors. Right. You know why? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, but you know we why? Are. One minute. One minute. Let me finish this yeah, train sure, of thought. Yeah, sure, sure. I'd love to tell you why, because I understand it. Now, there's a historian by the name of E.H. E. Carr, one of the great historians in British history. Not a Marxist, but he was a great historian, great thinker. And he analysed, he wrote a book called What is History? In this book he explains that yes, we have inherited, now more than ever, the collective knowledge of mankind. You know, that's what the Bible is, the Koran is, the Torah is. The collective, the first spoken, then written down. Then the libraries, Alexandria, the British Library, the uh, Library of Congress, then the internet in your pocket available to find out the knowledge of human history, of human science, technology, art, ideas, culture. It's available to us. Correct. We have the collective knowledge of mankind at our disposal. That's right. But we do not have the collective property of mankind from these two million years at our disposal. That's That's that right. is the fundamental contradiction in world capitalism today. Well, I can tell you why. I Second can tell you why. contradiction. I can tell you why. That we is. produce. We produce across the entire planet. You go to the local shop. Almost every product in Primark or in McDonald's or in any of the shops on Oxford Street comes from every corner of the world. Every, even the clothes you're wearing, they will involve someone from India, someone from Pakistan, yeah. someone from Africa, someone from Asia, someone from China, someone from Europe. All hands will be on it. 
yet you have no trace back. You don't know where it comes from. That's right. That's All you right. know, the good's there. Yeah, we need it's a better cheap. dashboard. We need a dashboard that measures impact, yes, when you that believe, aggregates, when you so the believe, CEO when can you look. These that are the solutions, man. If you don't say one sec, one sec, what you said one followed one by the dashboard, you're, you're just criticizing without a solution. I love what you're saying. I agree 100% with what you're saying. So, the solution Present is this. The solution. the solution is this. We take, just as we have the knowledge of mankind, in theory at our disposal, although some people are working day and night to make it their personal property, Facebook, you know, Google and so on, in conjunction with the NSA, the National Security Agency of America, well, they want to spy on all of us. I've got a great solution for that. Hang I'm working on, on a minute, right hang on a minute. What do you mean keep it to yourself? I'm trying to listen to this guy. So what oh, right. we okay, have so to do... like my voice to just go down, yeah? No, it's okay. just... It's just okay, it's so just... that's quite authoritative of you. You've been getting away too much. It's like a give and take. I'm trying to listen to this guy. I don't want you to be shouting over him. If you want to talk, go and get a ladder. Yeah, I mean, there is the yeah, other I'll option, give you isn't my ladder. Which you said, you know. You want the ladder? Yes, I would love it. Yeah, they're okay. not Thank right next much. to me. If you want to no? go and speak... Oh, oh I, I like the dialogue. Oh, yeah, come no, 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 I mean, are they're people asking, happy with the dialogue? No have one's I been asking talking too much? No if one's you think I've been talking too much, please put your hand up and I promise you I won't say a word. Well, they, they do think that. Okay, so two people think that. Well, no, but you're, you're supposed to be democratic to some extent. I never Maybe said I'm there. democratic. I'm a speaker. You are undemocratic. You are undemocratic. Anyway, I hear you I wasn't guys, voting like to speak here. I stood up and speak I myself. Well, you're, you're welcome to come in. Yeah, but exactly. just don't go on about it. Don't make a big deal about it. Well, I wasn't going on about it until you he actually are. shut me up because I was listening to you. We spent two minutes now debating whether you're debating. Yeah, he shouldn't well, have said what you he said. You repeat so yourself. Anyway, let's hear what you've got to say now. So what I believe... And that's the accumulation of knowledge, of also of the rights of the people. The accumulation of collectivity, points you were making there. The accumulation of consciousness. The accumulation of solidarity. The accumulation of solidarity for other people, which previously perhaps did not exist. How did people think about Africans in, in 1720? They were an oddity or savages. That's how people thought about them. How did people think it was okay to enslave people? Because they thought they were less than human beings. Aristotle, right back in ancient Greece, he said, slaves are speaking tools. They are the instruments of production. They don't have a consciousness of their own. They don't deserve rights of their own. They're, they're creatures to serve us, the upper people. But we live in a world more divided economically between the top and below than ever before in human history. Eight people own more wealth than half of the world's population. Half of the world earns less than $2 a day. After two million years of existence. So I believe that just, that, just as you can justify your argument defending capitalism by saying, once it, let, me, let me just make my point, this one point, I'll just finish up on this. Just as you can defend rationally and logically your argument by saying that capitalism means all these freedoms and rights or is associated with them, when I point out they only existed for less than 100 years and yet human beings have been around for 2 million years, it is because those rights only exist because we've created a movement of solidarity, of collectivity fighting against capitalism and when the capitalists feared for their lives then they began to give concessions at the end of the first world war at the end of the second world war before i've had people who used to come here at speaker's corner they remembered the 1930s in speaker's corner back in the day in 1980s i knew people here and they told me people marched from jarrow with no shoes on their feet right so the idea that we've always had progress and it's not true. Capitalism is a system of commodity production for profit. That's the bare nature. But the character of the political regime, of our democratic rights, of our right to speak, of women's rights, of black rights, of rights of different nationalities, that is shaped by the activity and solidarity of the people. That is why the Labour movement, and I'm a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party, that's why the labor movement exists, to improve the rights of the people. But I believe that, the, that that objective should go beyond capitalism, 
and establish just as capitalism emerged out of Dickensian capitalism to become Western capitalism under welfareism in the 1980s, so we can establish out of the idea of socialism as it emerged in the West, as it emerged in China, in the Soviet Union and so on, we can marry together the two based basic elements. One is public ownership, democratic planning, democratic participation, rights for the entire people of the world, and the gradual dissolution of all borders in the planet, and the linking together of the planet based on the cooperation of working people of the entire planet. And I believe the technical mechanisms for such a system <coughs> did not exist, did not exist in 1917. I agree 100 percent. They do exist today. They did not exist That's in right. East Germany in 1989 even. That's right. I lived in East Germany. In East Germany we had no telephones or hardly any. We had no fax machines. We had no photocopying devices. We didn't even have a Gestetner machine to, to, to multiply, th to copy things, to make leaflets and so on. But nowadays we have the internet, we have modern communication, we have global logistics, and on the basis of that, yes, that's the reversal. On the basis of that, capitalism is revealing itself through Donald Trump. I don't know what the guy, what's the guy in Brazil, his name is Bolisario, what his name is? Belisario. Bolisario, the, 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 the guy in Brazil. Yeah. Through the reaction, through the Tommy Robinsons and the Nigel Farages and the AFD in Germany and the uh, uh, Le Pen in France, we have the reversal of that because capitalism in reality is unable to match the technology, the integration, the global division of labour, the global production, social production involving millions and millions of people Capitalism collectively on earth is unable to deal with that without reverting backwards. Capitalism drives that system. I think you're right. I agree. I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I think I think uh, Underlying it all, capitalism is about free markets and, and, and free movement of, of, of uh, capital, right? And your well, Adam Smith also people, said, Adam Smith also said, free movement of labour. And, and, and I yeah, agree with you that wealth what? distribution Why? should be even Why? down. Because I don't want criminals across the board. If you have open borders, anyone can walk in. My friend, the biggest criminals that there was a book published recently um, uh, about London being the central focus point, focal point for international crime. It, the City of London has special regulations and laws which allow it to be a conduit for billions and billions and trillions of dollars and pounds of stolen money from all around the world. It does because these borders do not stop the criminal movement. You say criminals, you don't want criminals coming here. Well, criminals are an issue for the police or for society. But I tell you this, I tell you this, I had a number of crimes happen against me in the last year. Assault, robbery, harassment, uh, people throwing bricks through my windows, probably paid by the landlord, um, illegal evictions, robbery of my property. But when you call the, when you call the police, when you call the police, the truth of the matter is, they tell you openly and honestly, we are not able to prosecute any of these crimes. That's right. That's not right. any of them. So in other words, you might believe that the system of capitalism has a police force to defend against criminals. It doesn't. It doesn't. So borders won't stop it either then, will it? Secondly, secondly, many of the people who are moving here are victims of crime themselves. Don't forget when Tony Blair, when George Bush and George Bush Senior dropped bombs on Iraq, on the Middle East, when they financed, armed and trained the gangsters who ruled over the Middle East. And when these regimes fell, we still supported Ben Ali in Tunisia. We still supported Mubarak in Egypt. He received $2 billion a year in American aid. When the Israeli government, the democratic government of Israel, when they send the IDF and shoot hundreds of protesters, thousands of protesters for coming near a fence, 
The British government says nothing. Absolutely it's silent. This is about capitalism. So it's about power. It is capitalism. Look, it's the way capitalism no, 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 no. manifests empires, empires in reality. And power have existed for about for millennia throughout history. The yes. Russians killed millions of people. Yes. The character of those empires, the character of that type of power, is governed by the type of underlying system operating. That's why it's clear there is a distinction between the Seven Years' Wars. There's a need an incentive to work harder. Well, That's who's saying we they progress. don't? My friend, what incentive? Let me just clarify what that means. In no Britain, I'll explain to you how I see it. In Britain, in London, when I get up in the morning and get on the tube about seven, which I don't do that often, but when I do it, and I stand in there and I pay a higher price to travel at seven, and I'm standing like this. And there are thousands of people on the platform and they're going one hour on the train to go to work in some shithole in the centre of London all day long, pressured by their employer, lunch break, 20 minutes eating a sandwich at the computer so they can show how keen they are and how they don't want to get sacked. And then when they get home after an hour on the train, they turn on the telly or the internet and then they're effectively falling asleep. Do they have an interest in the company? Is it something they chose to do? They're really they're chose to do? When they were children? When they, because the option of starting a business is limited by the marketplace. And the marketplace is dominated by monopolies. It doesn't mean you can't start a business. It means it's difficult to break in to a marketplace that is already highly saturated. I mean, Alan Sugar otherwise wouldn't have a job, would he? Because if everybody can set up their business, what's the point in all the skills that he teaches them on The Apprentice? No, it means that because there is competition in the market, and that's the very nature of capitalism. You have to be driven to the point of being willing to knock out your competitor. Otherwise, you may be wiped out yourself. And that, of course, is why monopoly is formed in the first place. Because once you reach a certain position of power, why have we got four supermarkets? Why have we got four supermarkets that dominate the sale of food in Britain? And that control the farming market in Britain? I think I'm going to say and thank part you. of the whole of the world. I'm going to say thank you one second, one second. It is because once you reach a certain scale, that scale enables you to knock out the others. That's how it works. The internet. Sorry? I'm saying once you reach a certain scale in a business, you are able to knock out the competition. Yeah. Not forever, not always, but generally that's the law. Yes, there are some trust acts. What they generally do is create an oligopoly instead of a monopoly. I, I have, I've Thank had something much. I've been really desperate to share with you guys for a while. Go on, quick. I guess maybe go you're on. the only person go allowed on, to speak, on. but I'm not. But it's very simple. What you're describing is that the way we get together around, get around ideas and make them happen creates a power structure right and create a distribution of value that is not fair the power structure is not democratic and the value distribution is not fair so i suggest that we really focus on that right but we focus on because that's what will be the transition it's not fair because i'll tell you why because when the founder and the investors come in uh, now they have so much power because they have money as well is they can start employing people at supply demand equilibrium so the minimum they, they pay them is which is great which no it's not bad if that's the only way we know how to create jobs it's great yeah I love it but that's what we know today but if you look at the total value generated in an organization and how decisions are made uh, they're made in the interests of the few and they and the value extracts to the top which is great exactly absolutely they're the most competent what do I want? What do I no, want you, on 715 hour controlling my business? Well, actually, wait a minute. It's because what we need to think about is if we manage to get the founders to rather than turn to the investors first and to bring in members. I don't understand what you're arguing. I don't understand what I'm arguing is. I've got, I've got your yeah, I, I, you really do. Where I disagree cool, cool. with what you're saying yeah. is the following. I do not believe, there are lots of people who've argued these type of arguments over the past. I do not believe 
in pleading for good ideas amongst the established capitalist class. Not because they cannot adopt good ideas, but because the structure of social power in society is organized under capitalism for the production of profits. So therefore, if profits are high, they may be willing to listen to ideas. Profits are fine when if you share them are low, in a way that's fair one minute, amongst, one minute, amongst stakeholders. One yeah. When profits are low, they'll retract their investments. Capitalism is not a system driven by good ideas, contrary to what many people think. Capitalism is a system driven by profit in which sometimes good ideas succeed. The point being that there is an objective material process happening that governs what human beings do. Capitalists themselves are not individuals choosing their destiny much as they think they can because they've got more money and therefore more power to choose than others. Instead of this, they operate within parameters established by the structure of power before they were born. And therefore they are agents, puppets within a system that blindly drives people to a certain type of behavior. I know a lot of people would like to, one sec, one sec. I know a lot of people would like to continue this discussion, but I'm a bit tired. Yeah, I did a walk and door this morning. I'm going to stop. Thanks very much for joining Thank in. You See you next week. Great. It's really great to me. I'll shake your hand. Well, you're fantastic. Content of my heritage from Yago Benami. Man, say it straight. Man, don't listen to BBC. Man, don't listen to ITV. Listen. I think that is COE. C-O-E, he's C-O-E. If you want to go on YouTube, C-O-E, he's the guy. C-O-E. I'm in yours. Say again, Faye. I'm in yours. Do you know he's got loads? He's probably the biggest one here. Yeah, subscribers. You mean, yeah? Yeah, no, he's got loads. He's, uh, there's not a bigger one in the park than him. So, uh, yeah, he's done a great job. Hello.